Hello everyone, my name is Travis Richards. I'm a postdoctoral researcher uh, here in the Wells Fisheries uh, Lab and I work in the Marine Biology Department. And I'm gonna to talk to, with you today a little bit about what I'm doing uh, as a postdoc here uh, at Tamhug. And the major project that I'm a part of is answering a very simple question. Uh, right now, across the state of Texas, uh, the popularity of fishing for sharks, uh, mainly coastal species like bull sharks and black tip sharks, uh, is increasing exponentially. And one thing we're interested in knowing is uh, whether or not these sharks, after they've been caught from the beach, survive. So typically, if you've seen somebody fishing from the beach, they catch the sharks, they drag them up onto the sand, they pull the hook out, they take some pictures, and they release them. And so both the fishermen and the scientists would like to know how will these sharks do after they survive. And so similar to some of the other work we're doing in the lab, we're using electronic tags to answer these questions, but we're using a different type of tag. Um, we're using what's called uh, an accelerometer data logger, uh, and it's this fancy tag right here and it actually has several instruments all combined into one package. Uh, and so the big antenna, what you see here, is a VHF antenna and we actually use this to find the tag after it's been deployed. We have a spot tag, which is just used for, as a GPS locator. And then inside the tag we have the accelerometer, which uh, records detailed information in all three axes. And so what's nice about this is as the shark is released, it swims out with this accelerometer and it gives us detailed information on how many tail beats per minute you know, it's, it's doing, whether or not it's listing side to side or dipping up and down. And so when we get this tag back after it deploys after one or two days, we can download all those uh, data and see exactly how that shark is moving through the water, how long it takes to fully recover and go back to sort of a normal swimming pattern uh, after it's been caught from the beach. Uh, and of course, we can tell by the accelerometer data whether or not the animal dies. Uh, so both survivorship information as well as behavioral information is recorded by this tag. So in addition to talking about what I'm doing as a postdoc here in the lab, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I did as a PhD student, which was just finished just last year. And I used methods that we use throughout the lab. I think you heard from Emily Meese talking about how we use stable isotopes. Uh, to reconstruct food webs in marine systems. Well, I used that same method, stable isotope analysis, to reconstruct food webs in a unique environment, and that was the deep sea or deep pelagic environment in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and so the purpose of my PhD was to collect as many different organisms from the deep sea as possible, analyze the chemical signatures, the stable isotope signatures in their muscle tissues, and use that data to reconstruct the structure of the food web in the deep sea, because we know very little about the deep sea and in particular, we know very little about food webs. And of course, food webs are crucial to understanding ecosystem function because that is, you know, that tells you how the energy flows through a system from the primary producers all the way up through the apex predators. So if you want to manage an ecosystem, you have to understand how the food web is structured and how it functions and maybe how it changes through time. Uh, and so I have here today some example organisms that we collected from the Gulf of Mexico, the deep sea environment, over the course of four years. Uh, and I just wanted to geek out a little bit about the deep sea and tell you about uh, some of the really cool animals that we actually have here in our backyard. All right, here's a little sample platter of some of the species we get in the deep sea. And I pulled these uh, animals in particular because they represent some of the dominant uh, families uh, of species that we have in the deep pelagic Gulf of Mexico. So I'm going to start over here in the top left with these two uh, fish here. These are two different species that belong to the same family, and that family is Mictophidae, or the lantern fishes. And so lantern fishes are a group that are distributed worldwide. They are ubiquitous throughout the world's oceans. They are numerically one of the dominant groups of deep sea fishes. And that's important because they serve as an important sort of top-down influence in the food web because they eat zooplankton constantly. So they swim up to the surface at night where zooplankton are plentiful. They leave the deep sea uh, and swim up uh, under the cover of darkness to avoid predation, and they feed heavily on zooplankton. And then they migrate back down uh, to the deep ocean during the day to sort of hide uh, from their predators. Uh, and while they're down there, they are often eaten by larger species. And by swimming up to the surface, feeding heavily, and swimming back down, they're actually an important vector of energy from the surface of the ocean to the deep sea. So they actually connect species uh, from the surface, the zooplankton with species down in the deep sea who may, maybe uh, don't migrate up. 
Uh, and they, the lanternfishes get their name because like a lot of deep sea species, uh, they can create their own light, right? They use bioluminescence. And what's interesting about them is they actually have these bioluminescent photophores along the sides of their body. It might be kind of hard for you to see uh, on both species. And many of the species of mctopids have species-specific patterns of these photophores, and so scientists believe that they can use these to signal uh, to their mates what species they are. Hey, I'm friendly. Let's together. Let's get together. Let's mate. Because you got to think, if you're in the deep sea and it's dark, and you're creating light, yes, you could be attracting prey. You could be attracting a mate, but you could also be alerting a predator to your whereabouts. So they have this species-specific uh, sort of light signal that they send out. And then this species down here, which is called diaphys, is actually really interest because, interesting because if you look in the, the front of the face, you can see this sort of silvery um, section on its nose. That is actually a light producing photophore. And so scientists think they actually use that almost like a searchlight uh, to look for a specific prey uh, using their own bioluminescence. So a very important and interesting group, the mctophids. Over here, we have what is called a hatchet fish. You might have seen these featured on uh, BBC's Blue Planet. It's another midwater fish. They also migrate vertically up through the water column at night to feed. Uh, but they have this nice silvery coloration uh, that actually reflects the light around them and helps them blend in. And if you can look very carefully along the belly, it's kind of hard to see. They also have photophores. What's interesting about these photophores is they actually use these photophores to match the color of downwelling light to help them camouflage. So if you're a predator in the deep sea looking for prey, the way you look for prey is you get underneath them and you look up because you're gonna look for the silhouette that the, fish, the fish's body makes um, because of the, the sunlight down, uh, filtering down through the water column. And if you wanna get rid of that silhouette, you need to make your body the same color as that downwelling light. And so what's interesting about these hatchet fish is they actually have, it's hard to see, they have a photophore in their eye that they use as a reference point. So that photophore tries to match the color of the downwelling light. The eye sees that and then that signals to the belly what color to sort of make uh, the belly photophores. And that hides their profile uh, from predators looking at them from below. So they have basically uh, a way to eliminate their profile or, or their silhouette to predators looking uh, from deeper waters beneath them. So hatchet fish, very interesting group. This species over here is pretty fascinating. This is a type of dragon fish. This is more of a predatory fish. These are smaller examples, uh, but they get relatively large for deep pelagic fishes. They can get up to about 12 inches long. Uh, and they eat mctophids. Uh, they feed predominantly on mctophids. And you can again see they have sort of these light producing photophores along their jaws or along their face. And like many deep sea predatory fishes, you can see how gigantic their gape is. Right? If, you, if I pull that jaw back, you can see it, it can open almost 180 degrees. And so they're very good at swallowing prey uh, many times sort of their head size. And a lot of deep sea fishes have uh, that ability. It allows them to sort of take advantage of any meal when it comes by. So this dragonfish is a, an interesting example of what a predator in the deep sea looks like. Again, very elongate. Not great swimmers, mostly a sit and wait predator. Another sort of dragonfish like species is this bristlemouth. Bristlemouths uh, are one of the, the families Gonostomatidae. They are perhaps the most abundant fishes on the planet. They're found in all the, the oceans of the world and they are highly abundant. Uh, and this is an interesting fish because they have really nice examples of these photophores all along their bodies. And again, you can see these bristlemouths, which eat crustaceans like these shrimp have pretty huge uh, and wicked looking mouths with lots of backwards recurved teeth to sort of hold on to their prey. So an important consumer in part because they are so abundant. Now we get to some of the crustaceans. Crustaceans, numerically speaking, often match uh, the abundance of fishes in the deep sea. Uh, interestingly, almost all of them are colored red. Uh, so these two migrate up through the water column at night to feed, but if you remember from sort of your intro to oceanography class, red light uh, dissipates the fastest in water. So if you are red colored, uh, there is no red light and you appear pitch black in the deep sea. Um, and so they come in all shapes and sizes. Uh, these are two extremely abundant uh, species. This is Notostomius uh, in the deep sea. And we have a larger specimen here. 
Uh, but some deep sea shrimp, not this species, but a similar species, they also use bioluminescence. They don't use it in the same way that the fishes do. They don't have photophores all the time. Uh, some do, but this one species actually uses uh, bioluminescence in a very interesting way. It's called the spewing shrimp, and when it's uh, sort of startled by a predator, it will actually sort of vomit or throw up bioluminescent liquid. It will spray it out of its mouth, and that will either distract the predator, or some people say it will actually stick to the predator's face and then that predator now has like this bioluminescent marker which could alert another predator to its presence and that predator can come eat the other predator how often that happens we don't know but regardless they use uh, the bioluminescent sort of vomit as a way to distract or deter predation in the deep sea so just a few examples of, of some of the cool animals we have right here in the gulf of mexico and uh, there are many many more to talk about